these are the stories making the headlines at this hour. The UN Security Council has convened a cold story meeting on North Korean issues amid increased provocations. South Korea called for an urgent response as it took part in such a meeting for the first time since beginning its term as non-permanent member. U.S. President Joe Biden says his country will press on with strikes against Yemen's Houthis amid their continued attacks in the Red Sea. Israel also continues with its offensive in Gaza as the EU calls for a conditional ceasefire. The 2024 Winter Youth Olympics kicks off today in Kangwon, where young athletes will take part in winter sports over the next two weeks. The opening ceremony is for tonight. Good afternoon. We start with the UN Security Council's closed door meeting on North Korean issues. Among the discussions were Pyongyang's recent solid fuel intermediate range ballistic missile launch and military cooperation with Russia. South Korea took part in such a meeting for the first time since beginning its term as non permanent member. Che Soo Hyung reports. The United Nations Security Council met in New York on Thursday local time to discuss North Korean threats in the new year. This comes as South Korea, a non-permanent member of the council, has requested international cooperation against the North security threats. Other countries such as the U.S. and Japan also requested the meeting, which focused on North Korea and non-proliferation. In the meeting, the members discussed the regime's recent threat to Seoul and the international community, as well as the North Korea's launch on Sunday of an intermediate range ballistic missile. South Korea emphasized that the North nuclear policy has changed in the last two or three years, so the Security Council should react not only by focusing on ballistic missiles launched by North Korea, but rather all types of security threats that harm international peace and safety. After the meeting, South Korea's UN ambassador Hwang jung guk said in-depth discussions took place. South Korea and the U.S. urged the Security Council to break its silence, mentioning that Kim Jong-un, the leader of the regime, had declared a hostile relationship between Seoul and Pyongyang. However, experts say it may be challenging to reach an agreement in North Korea matters due to the current Security Council divisions. Che soo Hyung, Arirang News. The nuclear envoys of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan gathered in Seoul amid concerns over closer ties between North Korea and Russia. They blamed the North for unnecessarily raising tensions on the Korean Peninsula and urged the regime to engage in dialogue. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Yun-ji has more. The nuclear envoys of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan met in Seoul to discuss issues on North Korea amid heightened tensions in the region. Seoul's nuclear envoy Kim Gun said Pyongyang's version of a closed-door policy will only hurt itself and called on the regime to return to talks. We call on North Korea to immediately stop provocations, lift its self-imposed ban on talks, and come back to the path of denuclearization, peace and prosperity. His remarks come as North Korea fired an intermediate-range ballistic missile on Sunday, which could be capable of targeting U.S. military bases in Guam or Japan. The North later claimed that this was a successful test launch of its solid-fuel missile carrying a hypersonic warhead. During the trilateral talks on Thursday, the U.S. nuclear envoy also criticized the North for unnecessarily raising tensions. The United States is also deeply concerned by the recent uptick in hostile rhetoric particularly toward the Republic of Korea from the DPRK regime. Such rhetoric is unnecessarily increasing tensions on the Korean Peninsula. Thursday's meeting was just a day after the North Foreign Minister Choi Son hee visited Moscow, where she met Russian President Vladimir Putin and discussed enhancing bilateral relations in all areas, including what Russia called sensitive ones, which could mean military cooperation. The transfer of these weapons and related material uh, flagrantly violate the multiple UNSC resolutions and supports Russia's war of, war of aggression. We also need to closely monitor what Russia might provide to North Korea in return for these arms exports. The U.S. and its allies have accused Russia of using North Korean missiles in its war on Ukraine. 
And officials from Seoul and Washington have said North Korea is supplying munitions to Russia for use in its war against Ukraine in return for satellite technology. Peun's Arirang News. A senior U.S. official predicts the recent growing military cooperation between North Korea and Russia will drastically increase Pyongyang's threat in Northeast Asia over the next 10 years. The White House National Security Council senior director, Perene Vedi, during a conference hosted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies on Thursday, cited how Pyongyang Moscow military cooperation was reaching unprecedented levels. Meanwhile, NATO's military committee chair Rob Boyer said Russia could receive missiles from Iran as well as from North Korea. U.S. President Joe Biden says his country will press on with strikes against Yemen's Houthis amid their continued attacks in the Red Sea. Israel also continues with its offensive in Gaza as the EU calls for a conditional ceasefire. Lee Sing Jae has more. U.S. President Joe Biden said Thursday that a U.S. offensive against the Houthis will continue, as he noted that the Yemeni rebel group has not stopped their attacks against commercial ships in the Red Sea. The comments come as the U.S. conducted a fifth round of strikes on Yemen on Thursday after a U.S. ship was attacked by a Houthi drone. Washington says the string of attacks against the rebel group were defensive in nature and that it does not seek war. Amid growing conflict between Iran and Pakistan, the White House says the U.S. does not want to see an escalation in clashes between the two countries. White House National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said Thursday that it does not want to see an escalation in South and Central Asia, adding that the U.S. has been in touch with Pakistan. The conflict began when Iran conducted strikes against militant groups in Pakistan's Balochistan province, which resulted in the deaths of two children and injuries to several more people. Pakistan responded with attacks of their own. Over in Israel, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejected U.S. calls to scale back Israel's military offensive in the Gaza Strip. The Prime Minister on Thursday also stressed that Israel categorically opposes the establishment of a Palestinian state after the war. The comment drew ire from Washington, who said the two allies are not on the same page regarding Gaza issues. Meanwhile, the European Parliament called for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza, but added that it must be conditional on Hamas releasing the hostages it took in the October 7th attacks, as well as the full demilitarization of Gaza. Responding to the passage of the vote, Israel's ambassador to the EU said Israel is happy to see that the European Parliament understands the need to release the hostages and disarm Hamas before any ceasefire. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. South Korea's trade ministry has shifted its funding plans for R&D towards bigger and riskier projects rather than those smaller in scale. Moon Hye-ryeon explains. Funding for industry research and development will now be centered around high-risk, high-return projects, as well as fostering future talent. The Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy held a roundtable session on Thursday to announce how it would spend its portion of the 2024 R&D budget, which is around a fifth of the country's total R&D budget. 70% will be allocated to provide support in 11 key sectors, such as the semiconductor industry, which has recently begun to show signs of recovery. This equates to around 1.3 trillion Korean won, or just under 970 million US dollars for the government, but a total of 2 trillion won of public and private funding will be given to 40 projects in these sectors this year. Continuing with the overarching theme of concentrating efforts towards select projects, the government will also increase support to develop what it has dubbed game-changer technology. To do this, the industry ministry has pledged to set aside 10 percent of its annual budget to support high-risk projects to solve industry issues. In addition, it aims to reduce small-scale projects and focus instead on those on a larger scale to maximize market performance. And to do this, it will be expanding the number of projects worth more than 10 billion won from 57 last year to 160 projects this year by combining those with similar research goals. A new methodology to assign research and development projects will be implemented this year to give companies and researchers a more active role. 
the government will present goals that need to be achieved and companies and researchers can lead the project planning process where they can form a consortium and allocate research funds among themselves. Another key area in which funding will be raised is nurturing future talent by increasing the number of graduate school programs in new industry areas, such as chips, batteries and displays, from the current 3 to 11 this year. Moon Haryan, Arirang News. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan have welcomed an agreement by their leading national laboratories to cooperate in the field of quantum technology. This came as the heads of Seoul National University, the University of Chicago, and the University of Tokyo met in Davos on Thursday and signed a letter of intent to begin a three-way partnership on economic exchanges and joint research. Issuing a joint statement soon after, National Security Advisors Chang Ho-jin, Jake Sullivan, and Takeo Akiba said this innovative partnership will bring tangible benefits by training a quantum workforce and strengthening collective competitiveness in the global economy. Following their Camp Davis summit last August, South Korea, the U.S., and Japan have been working towards scientific cooperation, signing a three-way agreement in December. Seoul's top office says going forward, it will continue pursuing summit diplomacy to gain tangible benefits for the South Korean people. The future of artificial intelligence is high up on agenda at the annual general meeting of the World Economic Forum. And at the Davos Forum on Thursday, there was discussion and debate on AI's potential and risks, with OpenAI CEO Sam Altman attending as a panelist. Allman said that while we expect AI to handle all tasks with speed and precision, it cannot be compared to humans. He also stressed that we need to understand that AI can make mistakes and understand its limitations. This year's meeting in Davos has been focused on ethics, policies, and the regulation of artificial intelligence. The number of vehicles in South Korea powered by fossil fuels fell last year for the first time since data was first compiled in 1999. According to the Transport Ministry on Friday, the combined number of diesel, petroleum and LPG vehicles dropped by 0.5 percent compared to the year before to 23.6 million vehicles. This was mostly attributed to an increase in demand for eco-friendly cars, with the number of electric vehicles increasing by nearly 40 percent on-year and hybrid vehicles increasing by 32 percent. Amid South Korea's declining birth rate, the country's main rival parties are pumping up pledges ahead of the April general election to ensure a better work-life balance for parents. Ishifu reports. With just a little over 80 days left until South Korea's 22nd general election, the parties each announced on Thursday a new set of pledges aiming for a common goal to save the country with the lowest birth rate in the world since 2013 from its declining population. The ruling People Power Party says its main goal is to bridge the gaps across families with varying incomes and working environments. This low birth rate issue is related to the gap when it comes to the burden of raising a child and the gap between working at large corporations and small businesses. We think that bridging these gaps is the first step towards solving the low birth rate issue and building a society of co-prosperity. The party plans to make a month-long paid paternity leave mandatory and amend laws to guarantee childcare leave upon request. Furthermore, they will increase the maximum monthly childcare leave payment of 1.5 million Korean won, around 1,100 U.S. dollars, to 2.1 million Korean won, around 1,600 U.S. dollars, to match the minimum wage. Small businesses will be given additional incentives for implementing childcare leave. And by 2025, there will be more support for those not covered by national employment insurance, such as independent artists and farmers. The main opposition Democratic Party, meanwhile, is putting the emphasis on providing financial and housing support. The state will directly support the formation of basic assets for all newlyweds. We will further strengthen the nation's responsibility for childbirth and care and come up with groundbreaking measures to deal with the housing problem. 
The party will offer public rental housing for parents of two or more children. It will also give out new interest loans of up to 100 million Korean won, around 75,000 U.S. dollars for newlyweds with a child, and a 50 percent reduction of the principal upon the birth of a second child. The birth of a third child would grant a 100 percent repayment exemption. Monthly cash vouchers will be given to parents of school-aged children worth around 200,000 Korean won, or around 150 U.S. dollars. Plus, there will be more child care support for single and unmarried parents. Both parties aim to establish a new ministry focused on the declining population problem. In response to the proposals, Hong Tae-yoon, the director of the Presidential National Policy Office, agreed that revolutionary policies were needed in terms of social infrastructure and the economy to deal with this issue appropriately. Yi shi Arirang News. The 2024 Winter Youth Olympics kicks off today in Kangwon, where young athletes will take part in winter sports over the next two weeks. The opening ceremony is set for tonight. Yoon Jin reports. The fourth edition of the Winter Youth Olympics will open in eastern South Korea's Gangwon-do province on Friday evening at 8 p.m. This is the first time that the quadrennial youth winter sports event is taking place in an Asian country, as it was previously hosted by Austria, Norway and Switzerland. It's also the largest winter youth Olympics ever, with 1,803 athletes representing 79 different countries, competing in 81 events across seven sports and 15 disciplines. South Korea, as the host, will have the largest delegation of 102 participating athletes. Welcoming young athletes from around the world between the ages of 15 and 18, the opening ceremony will take place at two venues, the Gangneung Oval and the Pyeongchang Dome. Several venues used during the 2018 Pyeongchang Winter Olympics will be used again. All ice events, short track and curling will take place in Gangneung, while all sliding events, cross-country skiing and the biathlon will be held in Pyeongchang. The nearby town of Jeongseon will hold alpine skiing and moguls in freestyle skiing, and the county of Hwengsong will stage snowboarding and four freestyle skiing events, slope style, half pipe, ski cross and big air. With a greater focus on friendship and education through sport, medals are being awarded to the top three finishers, but there will be no official medal count by the International Olympics Committee. Five nations, Algeria, Nigeria, Puerto Rico, Tunisia and the United Arab Emirates will be making their Winter Youth Olympics debut. The event will run until February 1st. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Germany-born South Korean actor Yoo Tae-oh has been nominated in the leading actor category at the 2024 British Film Awards. Yoo is nominated for his role in the movie Past Lives, which was written and directed by Celine Song, a Korean-Canadian director. The movie, which tells the story of two childhood street sweethearts which, who reconnect after many years, also received nominations in the film Not in the English Language and Original Screenplay categories. The British Academy of Film and Television Arts honors the best British and international films of the past year at its annual ceremony. This year's BAFTAs will be held on February 18th at the South Bank Centre in London. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. In Singapore, the country's former Minister for Transport, S. Iswaran, was charged with corruption on Thursday. Iswaran had been arrested last July but remained as minister until his resignation on Tuesday. In the city-state that prides itself with having a clean government, he would have been the country's first sitting minister to be charged with a criminal offence. Singapore's anti-graft agency, the Corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau, said that Iswaran faces 27 charges for allegedly obtaining kickbacks worth almost 290,000 US dollars from Malaysian property tycoon Ong Beng Seng in exchange for advancing Ong's business interests such as the Formula One's Singapore Grand Prix. Iswaran allegedly accepted bribes including flights on Ong's private plane, luxury hotel stays, and tickets to musicals and sports events. He denies all charges. If convicted, Israelan faces fines of up to 75,000 US dollars or up to seven years in prison.
In Japan, the country's defense ministry signed a deal with the U.S. on Thursday to purchase up to 400 Tomahawk cruise missiles amid growing threats from China. Defense Minister Kihara Minoru and U.S. Ambassador Rahm Emanuel oversaw the signing of the contract in Tokyo for the multi-billion dollar deal. The purchase follows Prime Minister Fumio Kishida's adoption of a new security strategy in December 2022, where he pledged to double annual defense spending to around $68 billion dollars through 2027. If executed, this would make Japan the world's third largest military spender after the U.S. and China. Japan plans to complete the deployment of the Tomahawk missiles by 2027. In the United Kingdom, lawmakers on Wednesday voted in favor of Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's bill to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. The PM managed to overcome rebellion from Conservative Party members, which hindered previous efforts to pass the bill, with the legislation passing 320 to 276. The bill had been heavily scrutinized over fears of human rights breaches, but with immigration a crucial issue for Britain, Sunak has made stopping asylum seekers arriving in small boats a priority for his government. Under the plan, migrants who illegally arrive in the UK will be sent some 6,400 kilometers away to Rwanda to have their asylum claims processed. The bill is yet to be approved by the House of Lords. In the U.S., New York City and eastern states are expecting further snowfall on Friday as an Arctic air mass brings cold temperatures into the weekend. The National Weather Service reported potential snowfall across the region starting on Friday of between 2.5 and 13 centimeters. In New York City, where earlier this week a 701-day drought of measurable snow was broken with 4 to 5 centimeters of snow on Tuesday, Heavy snowfall of up to 8 centimetres may be seen. New York City's Emergency Management Department has issued a travel advisory for Friday. Kim Xiong, Arirang News. Good afternoon. The warming trend should continue today in most places and into the weekend with snow in the forecast for the east of Gangwon-do province. Until tomorrow, mountainous regions in Gangwon-do could see more than 30 centimeters of snowfall with a heavy snow advisor issued there. Those in east coast regions need to brace for heavy snow through the weekend. Speaking of Gangwon-do, where the Winter Youth Olympic Games will take place for the next two weeks. The weather today looks to be a snowy one for Pyeongchang and Gangneung, and it will be freezing cold all day in Pyeongchang, so have a thicker jacket on. Much of the country are having highs that are warmer than norms with good air quality nationwide, but it will be rather cloudy all day in many places. As tomorrow marks Tehan, a period of major cold in the seasonal calendar, the weather will follow the term next week. It's going to be one freezing week. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is once again spotted using a German luxury vehicle by Mercedes-Benz. This time it's presumed to be the ultra-luxury Mercedes Maybach GLS 600. Its price tag starts at 170,000 U.S. dollars. The footage was released by North Korea's state-run media, which last December also showed senior officials in Mercedes vehicles. But any exports of luxury items to the north are banned under sanctions. So where is Kim Jong-un getting them? 
where the car maker has recently confirmed it does no business with the North. And there's possibility of car laundering or Russia's gifting of cars in exchange for military weapons. Whatever it is, the sanctions don't seem to have affected Kim Jong-un, exactly what he may be trying to demonstrate with the show-off. That is all for today. Thanks for watching.